or not, there are crossing guards. That means children are going back to school. It's a fantastic thing to see. Wedding venues are booked. Uh, good luck if you want to have a wedding. You're going to have to book something in 2022. Restaurants, uh, they've, they've got people dining indoors. Um, this morning, I had an appointment in San Francisco. It took me an hour and a half to get across the Bay Bridge. So I guess we are getting back to normal. So we're in an environment right now that is truly unique. Uh, we're seeing an unemployment down. Uh, GDP is up. Um, equities are booming. I saw that um, the that, that, uh, stock market is still around 34,000. Uh, but the 10-year treasury still sits at only 1.63% today. So really good conditions to invest. So that kind of led me to ask a few weeks ago, is now a good time to purchase real estate for your business? And uh, that led me to put together tonight's panel. And so I'd like to introduce uh, some, uh, some experts in the industry and Actually, several of them are, are clients of the bank. And so uh, uh, tonight I've got with us, and we'll, we'll do introductions and give them a, a minute to tell, tell you about themselves. But we've got Kurt Shambliss from TMC. We've got uh, Michael DiGeronimo from Miller Star, Simon Vogt from Lean Associates, and Tim Tikalski from Sense of Us San Filippo. So uh, great to have my esteemed guests here. So. Again, I'll just start with myself, Don Merrick, Senior Vice President of Commercial Banking at the at Fremont Bank. Um, I'm in charge of uh, all commercial banking products, uh, including SBA lending, um, business lending, construction, commercial real estate, multifamily, um, and small business lending. Fremont Bank uh, is now over a $5 billion bank. And we're now the largest independently owned bank in Northern California. Um, it's great to have a place that is truly local, uh, but you still have all the same services that a big bank uh, is able to provide, whether it's our branches here uh, that ring the bay now, or wealth management and trust, <laughs> mortgage lending, and of course, commercial lending. All right, well, let me um, uh, hand over the mic to my guests. Uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, Kurt Shambliss. Uh, Kurt, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for having me today. Uh, I'm Kurt Shambliss with TMC Financing. And TMC Financing is what's called a certified development company. We work on one particular kind of SBA loan called an SBA 504 loan. And that's, I'll get into more details later, but it's it's the one where you get 10% down financing and a combination of financing between a bank like Fremont Bank that would do a first position loan. And then we through the SBA do a second position loan on the property um, up to 90% uh, financing. Uh, we offer 25 year fixed rate uh, on our loan. And as Don said, rates are still super low. We're, we're low 3% for 25 year fixed rate. Um, no matter how, how strong the applicant is or, or if the applicant has some, some weaknesses, if you get approved, everybody gets the same, same rate and same pricing. So it's a really attractive uh, loan program. TMC um, has been around since 1981. We, um, Last fiscal year, we're the largest CDC in the Western United States. Uh, so we do 300 plus transactions a year and uh, uh, happy to, to talk to you guys more about uh, what's going on in commercial real estate. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Let's move on to uh, Mike DiGeronimo. Hello. First of all, uh, good evening to everybody. I hope we have a good seminar here and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm a partner at the law firm of Miller Star Regalia, where I 50 attorney law firm based in Walnut Creek, California. Our firm represents everybody from local developer, property owner to Fortune 500 companies uh, in all aspects of real property law, um, including entitlements, due diligence, sale, disposition, leasing, uh, and many other aspects of real property. 
Uh, I've been doing this for far longer than I can care to remember, well over 30 years now, and um, look forward to adding to the uh, seminar tonight. And I, I do want to say that I've represented Fremont Bank for many years, had the privilege of doing so, and, and they are a great lender to work with. I mean, I've dealt with many other lenders that are that make your life difficult. Fremont Bank really doesn't. So I think there's a real value to, to having a good lender. Right. Thanks. Thanks for the plug, Mike. All right. Let's uh, let's hear from Simon Bo. Good evening, everybody. My name is Simon Vogt. I am a commercial real estate broker with Lean Associates and a principal with Lean Associates here in Pleasant, California. Um, I focus on leasing and selling um, of office and medical properties in the Tri-Valley and East Bay. And I've been involved in about 550 transactions over the last decade. And my focus has slowly shifted more and more towards um, owner user properties, which is what we're gonna be discussing tonight. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Simon. Let's go on to Tim Tukalski. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Tim Tukalski. I'm a principal with Sensiba San Filippo. And uh, like, like um, Mike, I'm, uh, I've been doing this for quite a long time. Actually, I just celebrated my 40th uh, tax season. Uh, I head up our real estate group for uh, Sensiba. And uh, also like Mike, uh, we've uh, got a very long standing connection with uh, Fremont Bank. Uh, so great to work with them. Great that they trust us uh, and we trust them. So um, happy to be here and happy to present. We're happy to have you here too. All right, well, um, before we get started with uh, some of the questions, a uh, uh, couple of housekeeping things here. So first, uh, we do have a drawing tonight. It wouldn't be a Fremont, Fremont Bank event if we didn't give away something. So um, we're, we're doing a drawing for, uh, for three different prizes and um, I'll announce the winners of those uh, toward the end of our session. Um, hey, I'm, I'm really respectful of all of your time. And uh, we're going to try to stick to the one hour as best as possible. Um, so we're going to um, really focus really on the spotlights of each uh, speaker and, um, and also have opportunities for you all to ask questions. So if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat. And um, one of my um, uh, helpers here tonight with our uh, wonderful client relations department uh, they're going to be monitoring the chat and uh, will let me know if uh, there are questions uh, from the audience that we want to ask as well. Um, but I'll go ahead and get things going and uh, open up with a question for all of our panelists to first answer here. So, um, so why don't we do this? Uh, why don't each of you share with the audience kind of like what's really hot right now that you're seeing in your particular sector of the industry right now. So let's go ahead and start with you, Tim. Well, I, I, I once heard an expression that said to do tax planning uh, in, the, uh, in the middle of an election was, was like uh, participating in the Olympics for tax accounting. And uh, yeah, we, we've got to throw in a pandemic on top of that. I, I think that this is just a Herculean task. So uh, obviously what I focus on, especially between now and the extended due date of, of May 17th is tax planning for our clients. But not only that, it's uh, in tax compliance, but, but uh, we're trying to, you know, at the request of our clients, predict what's going to happen. Um, and uh, I got to tell you, uh, so just just yesterday, uh, Biden released his uh, America's Families Plan, uh, where he is uh, now starting to solidify some of the campaign promises that he said he was going to do, um, which is increase the marginal tax rate to 39.6%, uh, which is to uh, uh, greatly curtail the capital gains rates that we are, we are experiencing right now at probably historic lows. Um, he wants to uh, eliminate 1031 exchange for transactions over $500,000. Um, 
uh, he wants to do away with uh, a stepped up basis on death. So, I mean, this is just, this just goes on and on. Um, you know, just, just last week, there were 32 bills that were introduced into the, um, into the House and the Senate, um, which some of them touch on, on uh, what I said primarily with respect to beefing up the IRS. Um, they're uh, uh, talking about focusing on, um, you know, extending the ACA that type of thing. So it's just a, it's a Herculean task trying to keep track of all this. Uh, so I guess the, the number one message that I've been sending to my clients is that if you are of the ilk to either sell a property because the economics makes sense or even to buy a property because the economics makes sense, you better do it quick, okay? <laughs> On the sell side, um, you know, capital gains, again, at a historic low, Take advantage of that. Um, try to close that before the end of this year. Can they make, you know, I often get a question, can, can Congress make tax law changes retroactive? Well, constitutionally, they can. They could introduce a bill and make it retroactive back to the beginning of this year. Now, will they do that, practically speaking? Likely not, but there could be a proration of the rates. I mean, again, I've been doing this for 40 years, so they could certainly change the rate midstream. And as, as Biden gains more and more uh, momentum, uh, you know, these bills will start to come out. Fortunately, he's focusing right now on, on corporations. Yeah, okay, you know, multi-million dollar corporations with offshore, that type of thing. Raising the corporate uh, 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 tax rate to 28%. But he, he made an overall statement. And basically what his agenda is that he wants to reverse what he calls the biggest uh, uh, 2017 tax law giveaways. So he, he would, I think it's his desire to reverse all the benefits that, uh, that were um, introduced under the Trump administration. So careful planning, um, not only on the income tax side, but also on the estate tax side, um, because uh, these benefits are going away. Sorry, I was on mute. Well, that's a lot to absorb. Uh, there's a lot to think about right now. Uh, certainly, um, you know, with the change of administrations, it's uh, putting a lot of question marks around uh, what uh, our business and personal taxes are gonna, gonna look like. Um, you know, kind of bringing it maybe home, you know, more here to the, to the Tri-Valley area. Um, Simon, you know, as a commercial real estate broker uh, with your office here in Pleasanton, you know, what, what about you? What's, what are you seeing a lot of right now and kind of what's occupying your time and, uh, and your thoughts? I mean, Don, really what we're seeing is uh, extremely low inventory of properties. Um, so most of the transactions that we're doing actually are off market, so they don't even hit the market. Um, so it's key for clients to be working with brokers that know the market, that know of opportunities, um, that could come to market and get snagged up before they actually hit the market. Um, I myself put just three properties, owner user properties on the market um, beginning of April and they're all three of them are in escrow right now. Um, so pretty wow. much anything that's gonna hit the market, there will be buyers for it. Yeah, so um, so so you're you're feeling pretty pretty positive about the market then overall? It didn't really change over the last year, even though we had the pandemic. Um, the transactions really did not stop for owner users, uh, especially for medical and dental users. Um, I myself saw seven or eight just dental transactions last year alone, um, buying commercial real estate. Um, a couple actually I did with you guys with Fremont Bank that helped finance them. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to help. Well, well, thanks, Simon. Let's let's go on to to, to Mike. Um, I guess as an attorney, there's never uh, any end of work and opportunities out there, and as long as there are contracts to be negotiated, um, there there's business for attorneys. So, what what what's um, kind of occupying your time, and what what are some of the trends or things that you're seeing in the market right now? Yeah, thanks, Don. So, I think what I wanted to talk about a little bit about deal volumes in terms of what we're seeing as a firm. So the areas that are particularly hot are anything relating to fast food, 
anything that has a drive-through lane is is a gold mine. Uh, industrial warehouse uses a lot of deals there. Live work units also very popular. Uh, what's not hot, although it's sucking up a lot of my time, is uh, urban office and offices in general, except for medical, dental, continue to be pretty strong. And retail that doesn't involve fast food is sort of a living disaster at the moment. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to change in the, in the foreseeable future. I mean, we're working on a lot of retail projects trying to reposition them. Um, so they're you know, there, there could be some opportunity there for people that have some foresight as to, you know, what might happen in the future, but it's a, it's a difficult area. Uh, but, but definitely a lot of activity and in, in the, there's a lot of buyers looking for property uh, and not a lot of inventory. So I would concur with what Simon said as well, but we, we do deals all across the U.S. And I think that's pretty reflective of, of deal volume pretty much everywhere. Yeah, it's interesting what you said about uh, drive-throughs. We're uh, we're actually financing construction of a couple of um, Starbucks drive-throughs right now for clients of ours. So uh, definitely the trend. Uh, certainly, COVID pushed that, but um, you know I think that's one of the the many things that we'll see uh, that COVID changed, which will probably be sticky going forward, even after COVID. All right. Well. Um, Let's go on to Kurt, uh, um, round us out here. What, what, what about from your offices there in Oakland? What, what, uh, what's occupying your guys' time? Well, I think you asked like what's hot and, and really SBA lending is, is pretty hot right now. Uh, with the pandemic, many lenders have, have tightened standards on conventional financing. Um, Maybe maybe a conventional lender would have done seventy five percent LTVs before the pandemic, and and some are reducing that, and they're they're only going seventy or, or less. And so we, with SBA lending, offering ninety percent financing, um, is just becoming more and more attractive. Um, that plus the benefits uh, within some of the stimulus bills that have passed, where they have reduced the fees that. SBA typically charges. They are um, uh, providing up to three months of forgiven payments on the SBA loan, uh, up to nine thousand dollars per month. Uh, so, so, and in general, I feel that SBA is is pretty front and center with the recovery. And so, a lot of people are talking about SBA and you know the whole PPP program and, and the success of that. SBA is getting a lot of attention, and um, and so we're we're just really busy. Um, our, one of our standard um, you know, taglines is own the, own the business, question mark, own the building, period. I mean, owner-occupied properties is, is really beneficial for, um, for many small businesses. And, and I think it can be said with, uh, with what Simon said and others are saying, it's, it's the product supply is probably one of the things that prevents us from doing more. But, um, but even, even with the supply that's out there, um, there's a lot of small businesses that are really seeing now as a good time to, uh, to, to buy a building. Well, well, thanks, Kurt, I appreciate that. And I think you know, your, your experience kind of share is, is, is very similar to what we're seeing here in, in commercial banking at, at, at the bank. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely seeing an uptick in applications um, our volume is, is, is very strong. Um, we do have a lot of clients that are um, looking to take advantage of lower interest rates to, uh, to purchase real estate for uh, their business. And, and that real estate could be anything. I mean, we've seen um, you know, construction companies just purchase uh, land to park their trucks or, and equipment. Um, we're seeing a lot of professionals out there. Uh, see some of our clients actually on tonight uh, that we've recently done transactions uh, for. So uh, certainly the, the dental industry, um, professional services, um, you know, lot, lots of, lots of uh, business to be had there. Uh, so we've uh, lent on, on medical offices, uh, still seeing some, some smaller retail uh, occasionally, as well as, um, you know, small office space. So uh, certainly one of the trends that, that we've seen a lot of is, is the, the opportunity to, to move out of 
maybe the big class A buildings and and move back to that woody walk up building that's uh, you know closer to home and uh, may not have all the slick glass and steel, but you know you can park right outside your front door and 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 be in your office and in 10 seconds. So, um, you know, we're, we're busy, we're doing a lot of lending. And, um, you know, I think that uh, with the four of you, I think we've already answered a, a lot of that first part of the question, which is, is, is now the right time? And I think uh, uh, generally it sounds like the answer is yes. So let's, um, another question I wanna ask you all is, um, you know, if, if you're a business owner and you're, and you're, you're starting to, you know, plan out the process of making a purchase, what are, what are some of the mistakes that you've seen business owners make? And, uh, and what would you suggest maybe in terms of, of how to avoid those? So um, I'll start off with Simon this time. So Simon, um, you know, what are some of the mistakes that you've seen out there? Sure. Um... One common mistake that I've seen is people not planning properly for the future, for future growth of their business. So locking in um, a billion that might be too small uh, just because it works right now, might not work in three, four years from now. Um, so planning it properly for the future growth of the business, I'd say that's one. Um, and the other one that I've seen, which thank God I was not involved in, um, is making sure that the use is approved through the zoning for the building. So making sure that the, the property is properly zoned for the intended use of the buyer. Um, that's uh, something I've seen as well to watch out for. Yeah, nothing worse than making uh, purchasing a building and then yeah, only to find out that you can't actually operate your business in it, right? That's, uh, that's pretty serious. Yeah. Um, okay, Kurt, you know, um, I'm sure you see, see a lot of things. Uh, I mean, you guys are, are, are I think, the largest um, uh, CDC, uh, I, I think, but definitely in Northern California, if not all of California. So you see a lot of transactions. Uh, what are some pitfalls that you see? Yeah, so I, I was thinking about this. And um, one, one nice thing about partnering with, with a bank or, or a CDC as a lender is you, you get to rely on, on what the lender knows. And... Um, and some of the lender requirements. So yes, you're getting a loan because you need the money, but you also get to have the benefit of, hey, the lender needs this appraisal, the lender needs this environmental report, and the lender wants this. And a lot of those things that are protecting the lender are also protecting you, the, the buyer. Um, some I've seen some people buy a building with all cash. They didn't bother to get an environmental report and, and boom, you know, they have an environmental problem. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of one thing you can take some uh, uh, you know, comfort in. If you get a loan, you, you're gonna have some, some mistakes uh, prevented. Um, but even if you get a loan, there, there's still other mistakes you can make. And, and one thing I thought of is, is not consulting with your professional team. And we have a great panel here, but everybody should be talking to their CPA. They should be talking to their estate planning attorney or just attorney in general. Um, they should be talking to a commercial real estate broker, not a residential. Residential agents are great for homes and, and have, a, have a commercial broker for your, 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 your building, not just because they're your sister's friend who, who did a good job on the home loan so, or the home purchase. Anyway, I, I've seen many, many situations um, that could have been prevented if, if people just consulted their team of, uh, of professionals. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, I want to ask you, Paul, just one more thing. Um, uh, something that Simon said. So he, he was referring to uh, uh, businesses growing out of their building really quickly. One of, one of the things I've seen with, with SBA loans recently is um, uh, a fair amount of folks buying bigger buildings and then having a portion that maybe is not owner-occupied and they're actually leasing it to another tenant. Uh, is that something that you're seeing uh, over there at TMC? Absolutely, yeah, that, and that is, that's a, a great point. Um, the SBA allows uh, uh, property to be leased out up to 49%. Everybody kind of talks about 51%, but you, the other way to look at it is you can lease out up to 49% of your, your building and that's great rental income. 
um, oftentimes that's that's very helpful to get approved by the loan if, or by the lender if if they have additional rental income coming in. Um, so it does two things. It gives the rental income, but then it gives space to, to um, expand when, when the business is ready to expand. Yeah, yeah. We, we just actually approved a loan just like that earlier today. So it's, um, it's definitely uh, an element of flexibility. Um, all right, so let's see. We heard from Simon, heard from Kurt. Uh, Tim, from, from your perspective, what, what kind of mistakes do you, do you see? Well, uh, in, in no order, no, no order um, I guess the first one that pops into my head is, is entity selection. So uh, when, when clients uh, are buying real estate, the first question is says, well, should I, you know, should I buy it in my corporation? Should I, you know, I'm going to use this property in my business and I operate an S corporation. So I ought to, I ought to just plug that into the S corporation, right? And and the answer is no. I mean, that's that's really probably one of the worst things you can do is to buy real estate in a corporation period, even if it's an S corporation. Um, it just causes problems with, uh, you know, you've got appreciating asset that uh, is, is potentially subject to double taxation, very hard to specially allocate uh, income and expenses uh, when it's associated with an S corporation. So really the, you know, it should be purchased outside of the business itself, uh, even if the business is a partnership, it should be separated from the business operation, and of course have a, a, a lease between, you know, your privately held real estate and and the business itself. You know, and um, you know, speaking to that, I mean, my clients, I would say 95% of my clients have made their wealth not from their business but from buying the real estate that they lease to their business, okay? It pays the mortgage. So you wanna keep that valuable asset outside of your business asset because you're only gonna sell the business. Uh, you're probably gonna wanna keep the real estate and go to the mailbox and you know get a check. So I would say that was the, the number one. Um, secondly, I, I, I'm amazed at clients who, you know, uh, start to go down a path. I'm gonna sell this property and I got to do a 1031 exchange because I'm going to have a gain. All right. Well, how much gain are you going to have? Oh, I don't know. I just know I have a gain and, and I don't want to pay tax on it. Well, you need to run the numbers. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we're in a historic low as far as capital gains taxes. So it might make more sense for you to sell that property, pay the capital gains tax, and buy the property, buy another replacement property at a stepped up basis. Remember the good news about a 1031 exchange is you get to defer gain. The bad news is you're deferring a gain. <laughs> Eventually you're gonna pay the piper on that gain unless you die and there's a stepped up basis. But again, as I mentioned, Biden wants to do away with the stepped up basis. So, you know, the whole strategy of, of, of dropping you know, swapping until you drop uh, may be a thing of the past. So run the numbers, see if it makes sense to pay a capital gains federal tax of 20 or 23%, and then turn that into a 39.6% ordinary deduction through higher depreciation deductions. Um, so, you know, you definitely have to run the numbers. I think a, a, a third thing is, uh, and the bankers in the room are probably gonna love me for this statement, um, consider using leverage. <laughs> I can't tell you how many real estate clients that I have that, that say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have debt. You know, I don't want to pay anybody. Anymore. Well, are you stupid? I'm sorry, but you know, you have the ability to make money on the bank's money. And if leverage is positive and you'll see by my credential, I'm a CCIM, which means that I'm certified in commercial investment member. We run the numbers. What does it look like with and without leverage? So for God's sakes, don't bury your head in the sand and think you should have to pay cash for everything. You know, use the bank uh, when it makes sense. I mean, it, it, it does make sense from the numbers, run the numbers. Um, and then lastly, I think, I think the biggest mistake that people make when they do purchase real estate is they don't consider doing a cost segregation study. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of that, but... Um, a cost segregation study identifies the non-structural components in a building purchase. And if uh, right now under the current law, 
if you buy tangible personal property, you get a 100% deduction in the year of purchase. And tangible personal property, by the way, can be identified to real property if you have a proper study done. And, uh, you know, conservatively speaking, if I buy a piece of real property, a good cost segregation study can get at least 30% of that purchase price uh, designated or allocated toward tangible personal property. So literally 30% of the depreciable property that you buy in a real estate purchase might be qualified for immediate deduction in the year of purchase. Now, I had a, uh, I had a client who just had a banner year under COVID because he had the industry that, that supported it. And he said, what can I do? You know, I'm up like, you know, two, three million dollars in revenue this year. I need some tax shelter. I said, stop being a, a tenant and buy the building that you're in. And he literally bought that building uh, on December 30th. And through a cost segregation study, we were able to allocate a $1.6 million deduction. One day, he only owned it one day. $1.6 million deduction against his, his revenue. So um, those are what I see the mistakes to be. Uh, the, yeah, the cost segregation um, element is, is huge. And, and I mean, to have, be able to get that kind of tax deduction is pretty outstanding. I, I think um, uh, we just came up with our, our new marketing campaign based on what you said, Tim. Don't be stupid. <laughs> Let me borrow money from Fremont Bank. I think it's, uh, it's really going to resonate with people. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, let's go over to uh, to Mike DiGeronimo. Mike, um, you always have kind of good insights, and you know, being being a uh, being a lawyer, you probably see all kinds of strange transactions or strange decisions being made. Uh, you know, what, from your perspective, what are, what are some mistakes you've seen that, that, uh, that a business should try to avoid when they're buying something? Yeah. yeah. And I've seen a lot of mistakes over 34, 35 plus years. So, um, so one of the things I do want to follow up on that Tim was just talking about is it seems like on allocating the cost segregation, it's always seems like clients do it at the very last moment and, and their numbers are like fluctuating and, you know, you're, you're drafting the contract and, it's changing by the second. And it's always like the, the, the 11th hour right before closing. And I think it's because they don't really pay enough attention to that. And as Tim points out, it's something that pay attention to early because they're the great tax benefits and something you really want to rationally think about. It's not something to handle at the very last moment, you know, and drive your lawyer nuts when you're changing the contract 52 times. And, <laughs> and you know, plus it just adds to your legal bill for no apparent purpose. Um, so, so that's one item is, is sort of not fully planning things out until the very end. Um, but I, I want to talk about a couple of things we talked about here. Like one, zoning is a big, big item. And one item I see often is, is non-conforming uses. So what is a non-conforming use? A non-conforming use is a use that's permitted by law, but only in under limited circumstances. Like, for example, if you have a, a, a body shop and you're the you're the tenant and you want to buy that particular building, you know, oftentimes cities in their rush to modernize uh, want to make uses, uh, they want to change the use of the properties so it's it's housing or mixed use. And in doing that, they, they often don't allow the, the current uses to survive beyond the, the current occupant. So if you, if you bought that property with a non-conforming use, it, it value is greatly reduced for your business because it prevents you from really selling your business to someone else, uh, particularly if there's, any, if there's any break in the use. So uh, understanding the zoning is really important uh, before you purchase something. Uh, someone else mentioned contamination. You know, it, it, it's not just your property. It's, it's also understanding maybe what's across the street or what's next to you because that could really impact value. But, but I also want to say that contamination, there's a lot of, if you know what you're doing, and you put together the right team, there's a lot of value and, and a lot of uh, possibilities that aren't open to everyone that are willing to buy contaminated properties. If you get a good environmental attorney and a good environmental engineer, you can figure out to a large degree of certainty what the cleanup costs might be depending on the 
you know, depending on the contamination, anything petroleum related usually can be quantified. Things relating to dry cleaners and other solvents are much more problematic. But, you know, simply because you're looking at a property that has some contamination, don't rule it out. You just got to get together the right team to figure out whether it makes sense. But, but I've, I've seen many, many uh, individuals and, and institutions buy contaminated property, deal with the cleanup, and then make an absolute fortune on these properties because they're able to buy them at a discount. Um, another thing that we talked about in terms of zoning issues is often there are things on title that people don't adequately investigate. For example, you know, sometimes there's CCNRs or some sort of use restriction that runs with the land. So if you want to buy the property and turn it into you know, some sort of auto use, a car wash, for example, that could be precluded by a private recorded restriction that if you didn't properly look at title would, would defeat the purpose of your purchase. So really due diligence in all sorts of form, both in terms of zoning, property looking at title, understanding the environmental condition of the property. Um, another thing that, that, and I think Tim mentioned this earlier, is think about how you're gonna hold the property, not only from a tax perspective, but also from a liability perspective. I mean, so many times I see individuals buy property in their own name and I just, I just sort of wonder why. Um, you can you can deal with liability issues in terms of um, uh, you know having higher amounts of insurance. But I, I had a client that owned the shopping center, and there was a construction project, and a dentist was walking across this, the the shopping center and got hit by one of the contractors' trucks, and the 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 truck tire came to rest on the dentist's head. And as we know, dentists make a lot of money, and it was a relatively young dentist, and the the, the lawsuits that, that stemmed from that really tested the insurance limits of everybody involved in the center. So, you know, far better if you own property to have it in different LLCs and, and don't, don't put it all in one entity because you're just creating liability exposure. The other thing that's important is having good, a good insurance agent to understand what type of insurance you should carry, the types of insurance. There are different types of insurance if you're renting out the property and you're you know, some policies pick up some things and some don't pick up others. And so not having a good insurance broker or an attorney that understands coverages is, is a mistake I see. And then finally, I agree, no leveraging is a bad idea, but I also see people that way over leverage. You got to plan for a rainy day. And so I, I think it's always good to, you know, buy properties with a good equity cushion so that you can keep your lender happy and, and keep yourself out of trouble. I mean, the where I've seen people get in trouble is they're way over leveraged. And then when the, the economy turns, they're just, there's nowhere for them to turn. Um, and so I, I think always sort of planning for the rainy day and having some, um, have some sort of equity cushion is always, uh, always good to help you stay out. Um, and I think, oh, the other thing I want to talk about too, is you, if you buy a property with tenants in it, you really need to understand the leases. You need to get estoppel certificates which is basically representation from the tenant that the lease is what it's supposed to be, what you're reading. I had a case once where a person bought a building and the tenant claimed they had free rent for 20 years. Um, and we actually had to go to court to, to get rid of that tenant. But if they had gotten an estoppel certificate when they purchased the building, they would have saved themselves a fair amount of money uh, in terms of lawyer's fees. So you do diligence on the tenants of any building you're buying that's important as well. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, those 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 are all things um, that we've seen too as as we've closed loans. Um, you know, certainly validating those leases through the estoppel, or um, you know, uh, spend the time with your title agent to 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 make sure that uh, there aren't issues um, or clouds on title. Those are all key key elements. Um, Hey, I got a question here from the audience. Um, like this is directed toward Kurt. Kurt, um, with all the um, the government stimulus money out there, it, are there any special things going on with SBA that makes it maybe more advantageous to do an SBA loan now versus other times? Yeah, um, well, exactly. So some of the stimulus benefits that I was mentioning earlier, the, the reduction of fees and the, the forgiven payments, I think those are two two major things. Um, I can also tell, tell me tell me about the forgiven the forgiven payments again. How how does that work for 
for the people out there because not everybody may, may be aware of that. So for, for loans, for new loans um, that are approved before the end of September of this year, um, you would receive up to, well, you would receive, not up to, you would receive three months of uh, forgiven payments, meaning that um, the first three months of your, your, your loan, you do not have to pay, uh, pay, pay back those payments. Um, it is capped at $9,000 per loan. So um, $27,000 benefit, uh, but that's, that's just a, a gift from your Uncle Sam. And um, the other thing that, that Fremont Bank has, um, which is a great product at, in certain times, is the 7A loan. Um, you guys do, I, I, I provide SBA 504, um, but you guys also, um, in addition to doing the SBA 504, you also provide 7A. And with the 7A, they've eliminated all the, the fees associated with it. And the, the benefit of the, um, the three months of payments is for the entire loan amount, not just my 40% piece. So um, talk to your, your Fremont Bank representative. Both, both programs have pluses and minuses, but um, uh, there, there's some really good, good programs to, to, to look into when, when you get SBA financing now. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the 7A still does have the, um, the $9,000 a month cap. So it's, it's capped out $27,000 total but both programs 10 percent down so uh you know talking about what uh what tim was suggesting that's you know that's that's pretty deep leverage when you only have to put 10 10 percent down um so that's, it, 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 don, don and kurt isn't there the sba loans aren't, aren't there huge rate benefits too or is that incorrect it is correct no that's absolutely i mean our rate is is I, I should know. I think it's three point oh seven percent or three point one. It's 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 twenty five year fixed rate at a very low three percent rate, and yeah, that's right. that in of itself mind boggling. Mind boggling. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think Michael, what you were kind of referencing, if you're buying an investment property, if you're buying something um, uh, for a return, I think that's a different animal than a small business that um, is buying for their for themselves. And they might have the 30% to put down and get a conventional loan, but they would rather have that, that cushion uh, of that additional cash on hand to benefit their business, to um, you know, buy more inventory, buy hire another salesperson. Um, so the, the, the leverage, I think, for a small business buying their own property is, is I think, different than, than um, you know, uh, uh, an investor buying a Taco Bell uh, for a return. Right. And, you know, when we had to write these deals, we also make sure that, that our clients have, you know, plenty of liquidity set aside for that rainy day, just like uh, Mike DiGeronimo was saying. Um, yeah, I just got an alert that we got some, some other questions from, uh, from the audience. Um, Tanya, um, do you want to share, share a question? I do. Thank you for inviting me to help. And hello to everyone. This is Tanya James reporting in for question duty. <laughs> it's a fascinating program, Don. Well done. Thanks. Um, so first question is, do you need to personally guarantee the loans or can it be secured by business? I'll jump in on that one. For, for, for At least for SBA financing, yes, anybody that owns 20% or more does need to provide a personal guarantee. Um, it's just a, a hard rule that the SBA has. They feel that, that the the business owner knows that business more than anybody else. And um, they just kind of feel that the, the business owner needs to kind of stand behind the, the loan in that regard. But uh, Don, uh, I'll let you address maybe conventional loans that might have. Different. Yeah. Well, well, likewise, you know, on the conventional loans, you know, Fremont bank, we've, we've got, um, you know, a philosophy that really goes all the way back to, to Morris Hyman and, you know, his, his thought, you know, Morris Hyman was our, the founder of the bank back in 1964. And he always said, you know, if you, if you really care about your business and you really believe in it, then you should be willing to personally guarantee a loan as well. And so that's, that's a philosophy that we adhere to here at Fremont Bank. So uh, whether it's an SBA loan or uh, traditional financing, we're, we're uh, expecting a personal guarantee from, from anybody that's uh, a 20% owner or higher or is the managing partner of an LLC. Good can question. I make, can I make one comment on that? 
Uh, I guess I could permit that. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> I, I was going to say that this is why relationship with lenders matter. But I mean, oftentimes clients drive me nuts because they they want to go to the lender with the absolute bottom rate, but then you get some conduit loan or other lender that you have no relationship with whatsoever. And so if you do have a rainy day, there's no one home to talk to. So it's not just the rate, it's the overall relationship. And so I, I you know, whether it's Fremont Bank or Kurt's company or someone else, you just make sure you, you have a relationship with that, with that lender. Um, Cause it's hugely important down the road. There, there are all kinds of covenants that come with commercial loans that you, you may or may not meet down the road. And it's helpful to have someone you can, work things out with if you need some help. Thanks, thanks for that, Michael. Uh, you know, something that we emphasize a lot here and and uh, sometimes you can be, you know, penny wise and, and pound foolish. Um, you know, my my first job at Fremont Bank 11 years ago was in special assets. And I had a, a, a few clients who uh, we were able to work out their loans that we had with them, but they had actually also maybe had loans with, you know, these conduits or CMBS notes where, you know, they're really stuck and all of a sudden you're dealing with a special servicer, you know, located in Miami, Florida or Dallas, Texas. And instead of, you know, somebody up the street that you can actually sit down with and, and, and work something out. Um, Tanya, do we have any other questions? We have, yes, excuse me. We have about 10, so I'll keep yeah. going. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> if not more. Um, Next question. We have a worry of paying top dollar for a commercial property now for us to occupy, and then the market will take a hit. Is that a concern we should have? That's probably a good, you know, good, good question. Maybe we start out with, with Simon. You know, what do you think of that in terms of, um, you know, uh, buying what somebody may think is the top of the market and, you know, what, what happens when things turn around? Yeah, I think people have thought it's the top of the market for the last 10 years, almost every year, and it keeps on going up. Um, I Coming back to what I said before, the inventory is so low, and it's really has been extremely low for as long as I can remember. And I don't really see a lot more uh, small properties, corner users being built. So I feel like there's going to be always that high demand and low inventory going forward for the foreseeable future, which should definitely keep up the values of the property, if not continue to increase. Well, I have, yeah, a, I, I have a comment on that, Don. Yeah, please. Um, so it really depends on what your long-term plans are. So you're, uh, you know, and I, I, have a, I have a personal experience with that. I bought a, a very expensive home in 2008, which was clearly at the top of the market. And right after I, after I purchased it, it went down about $400,000. <laughs> But I was going to stay in that property. It didn't matter, right? And now it's probably you know appreciated to you know twice uh, from from that downturn. So I think it just you know why are you buying the property if you're buying it for your business and you're in it for the long haul? You don't care about short term. It's going to go up and down. You are in it for the great, long haul. Great, great point, Tim. Yep. Great. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's, it, uh, you know, it's a home for your business, just like your home is, uh, you know, for, for your family. And I think, um, you know, as long as the, uh, the building that you purchase works for the operations of your business um, in a long term perspective, then, you know, you're going to be OK. And, and, and you'll, you know, you really don't care about the, the various short term ups and downs that that occur. And I, you know, none of us are, you know, can see the future perfectly, but you know, those of us who've grown up and lived in California, it's, you know, been a long-term appreciation over the last several decades. Um, Tanya, what other questions we got? What kind of options are on the market for live and work spaces? And do those fall under the umbrella for a business loan? Um, I'll start off with with Kurt on that in terms of uh, from an SBA perspective. What what is what does live can, work do for SBA? You can still do it, and we we do some live work. Um, the way that SBA looks at that is that the business that we're trying to help still needs to be in fifty one percent of the total square footage of the property. So if it's like a two story with with let's say you're a some type of retailer, uh, you buy um, and occupy the entire 
ground floor, which is let's just hope around 51%, and the, the upstairs unit is residential and gets leased out, um, that works. But if it's a three-story building with two floors of residential and only one um, you know, ground floor, that's only be a third, and, and then we, we wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, from and, and from our perspective, um, you know, it's some really it's kind of depends again, similar to what um, Kerr was just saying in terms of the percentage of um, of, of use toward residents versus business. Um, there, you know, unfortunately, with the last downturn, um, you know, um, our our Congress passed a bunch of of rules around um, uh, you know uh, residential disclosures. And so uh, sometimes you could run into what's called the TRID rules when, um, when, when there's a property that's both uh, a personal residence as well as work. Um, but we're pretty creative. We're able to find ways to, to make those opportunities work. And you know, uh, I would bring it to, 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 to me or one of our bankers and, and, and we can see what, uh, what kind of options you might have. Um, go ahead, Tanya. We've got uh, just time check. We've got uh, um, about eight more minutes, and I know we want to do the drawing too. So let's let's try to fit in as many more questions as we can. Yeah, we got lots. Does having participated in PPP funding restrict availability of SBA funding to purchase a building? No, it does not. We, we need to we, we need to understand the, the 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 PPP loan. We ask if it's forgiven. We need the, the PPP loan numbers, but it does not count against your um, your your allocation of SBA dollars. Yep. Okay, next SBA question. And, um, <laughs> if I purchase a commercial property that needs work, let's say 5 million and needs 1 million of work, SBA and Fremont Bank will carry 5 million down payment plus give me 1 million for repairs or would I have to go elsewhere for the 1 million? We, we, see, we see a lot of those deals, you know, whether it's installing solar on a building that somebody's purchasing or, you know, needing to do a complete, you know, interior rehab. So, um, so, so we structure it as an as complete building. We get an appraisal with, the, you know, showing that the work is done. And then, um, Kurt, you could, you could explain the way that the, the loan is divvied up. But I'll just uh, Basically, Fremont Bank will handle the disbursements and treat it as a construction loan. Because we have a bunch of other questions, I'll just try to quickly answer. We would look at that as a six million dollar project, and then he would put in ten percent of the six million or six hundred thousand, and Fremont Bank and SBA would, would finance the rest. So we can get you the details later. But yeah, that's you, you would only have to come in with ten percent of the total project cost, including uh, improvements. Thanks, okay. Kurt. Um, what requirements does a business need to get started with a commercial real estate? What, what requirements? Is that the, the question? Requir yeah. What requirements does a business need to get started with a commercial real estate, with commercial real estate? So the yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, from, from our standpoint, you know, we're, we, we prefer to have a business that's been, been around for at least two years. Um, you know, the, uh, profitable, um, you know, we've, uh, if it's going to be SBA, then we're looking for 10%, uh, 10 equity. If it's not SBA, uh, traditional financing, um, you know, anywhere from, uh, from, uh, 25 to 35% down, uh, depending on the, the other conditions, uh, we'll also certainly look at, you know, the total cash flow, we'll look at the business cash flow, but also what we call the global cash flow, which would incur any, include any other uh, sources of income that somebody might have. Say, for example, a spouse that may have W-2 income. Uh, and we can certainly answer uh, that in more depth uh, if you want to email me after the, the panel. Okay. Um, I know we might, we have enough to probably do another five, six minutes. So here we go. I'm very curious about purchasing a property large enough for us to run our business from residential renovation and redevelopment office, warehouse, workshop, and conference rooms, and being able to lease a portion of it at a reduced rate to a nonprofit. If the goal is to purchase it at a, as a separate company, are there issues with the age or credit 
of that new separate company. So that sounds like maybe a, a Tim question, maybe. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it a Tim question? You're the smartest man in the room here. <laughs> Um, well, I wish I was paying a little bit more attention to the question because what it said. Um, so, so it says like leasing, leasing, the, leasing part of the space to a not-for-profit. Um, so maybe there's an element of tax advantage to that uh, as an owner occupied with a with a tenant. I don't, you know. Well, I was thinking there was more probably tax challenges associated with that, but uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just I I'd kind of toned out with all the details of that. Yeah, question. it was a lot. Why, but, why, yeah. doesn't, why doesn't the I, person I have that, one comment. I okay. mean, the, I mean, property value is a function of the rent a tenant pays. Yes. And credit worthiness that relates to the cap rate. So leasing to a nonprofit wouldn't necessarily be your best bet in terms of enhancing the value of the property. I think that's a good answer. Yeah, that's a good point. And if, and, and if we didn't answer your question again, feel free to, to email us after. No. We'll, Although we'll I, have to follow up. Let me qualify it by saying that some of the nonprofits are very wealthy and extremely profitable. So just you know, sure. But I think the key there was they said they were they were leasing it at a discount. So yeah, that, you're right. That would that would affect your 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 DSCR, right? Potentially. Yeah. Right. Good point. Yeah. Um, all right, Tanya. Why don't we Why don't we ask one more question and then we'll uh, go go to our drawing. Okay. Um, hi, Don. It's directed to you. I am, <laughs> I am looking for a rental multi-property with five or six units in a B-class neighborhood under one million to start investing in multifamily. But I don't find these as often. Uh, I don't know if there's more to that question. Um, well, yeah, I mean, no first of all, you know, um, you know, any, any multifamily in that range is, is, is something that Fremont Bank does a lot of. Um, you know, we love the, the Class B. We like the, you know, uh, more of the, you know, traditional blue collar neighborhoods around, uh, you know, all over the Bay Area. Those kind of properties just do, do really well, whether, you know, things are, are in the economy are booming or, or whether they're slow. Um, so I think that is a good investment. And we've got, you know, plenty of multifamily products that could they could fit that. And of course, if it is just a four unit, you can do that through, um, you know, the, our, our residential mortgage department here. And, and, since, that one, and think... since that one was not really an owner occupied yeah. question, let's go to, let's see if we have one more owner, owner user type question, and then we'll go to our drawing. This is, a, this is a great one. If you already have an existing SBA owner occupied loan, can you apply for another SBA loan? Is there a limit on how many SBA loans um, one can have? I'll try to take it, take, take it away, Kurt. Uh, there's no limit to the number of SBA loans that, that somebody can have. There, there are limits on the, the, the maximum outstanding dollars that, that one person can have. Um, so on any particular loan, um, the, the limit is five to five and a half million. Um, if you exceed that, at least from the 504 perspective, you can get multiple $5 million SBA loans um, up to 15 and a half million or sometimes even more than that um, if you're a manufacturer or if you meet some, some um, energy, uh, green energy producing uh, requirements. So in general, we have very few people that have over $15 million of outstanding SBA loans, um, but you the vast majority, you can get multiple um, SBA loans and, and a lot of people have multiple SBA loans. Well, and then I'll just add to that by saying that um, in addition to the 504, we see a lot of clients that might do the 504 for the real estate and then they might also do a 7A for equipment. Um, so, you know, that, that, that enables you to have, you know, multiple SBA loans as well. And again, up to that, um, that $5 million threshold. So that's, that's pretty common. Um, well, look, um, I did have a wrap up question for everybody, but I think just given the time and the, the, the interesting questions we got from the audience, um, we'll skip that. Um, I do want to uh, uh, go ahead and acknowledge um, the, the giveaway here. And uh, but before I do that, 
I, I do want to thank a few people um, here at the here at the bank first. Um, Michelle Wynn and Tanya James, who are uh, both part of our client relations team. And those of you who are clients of the bank know that uh, you know, Fremont Bank offers some pretty unique experiences. And uh, it's that team that really is uh, the strength behind those experiences and able to make us, you know, enable us to do some pretty neat stuff uh, in the community and, and for our clients. So thank you to the two of you for, for helping get this uh, set up and for running the webinar. I also want to thank Rolando Rodriguez. Uh, he is my go-to marketing person. Uh, he's handled all of the, um, you know, the, the email information, the postings on social media. Uh, Rolando, you're a great partner. And then, of course, again, want to want to thank my my guests tonight. Um, these are, like I said, uh, clients and friends of the bank and and go to people for for us on a lot of business questions as well. So uh, again, um, thank you, Tim, uh, from Sense of San Filippo, uh, Simon from Lean Associates, uh, Mike miller Star, and of course, Kurt from TMC. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, and, and get to um, these uh, winners. So, um, these people are actually all on Zoom right now, and I know at least one of them. So uh, first, we've got a wine basket. So this is what we're calling the wine tour basket, and it includes four wines from four different Fremont Banks clients' wineries. Can you believe that? We've got clients that own wineries. That's a pretty neat thing. Um, so uh, uh, this particular basket will go to... Ellen Kim. Ellen Kim, congratulations. Uh, Ellen, if you're Ellen Kim, if you're on there, just go ahead and wave and say hello. Uh, great, great to have you here and, and congratulations. Okay, we'll go to second prize that we're, we're giving away is uh, this is one that I love. And in fact, uh, it's uh, what uh, we ordered some of these extra baskets uh, when we did an event a few months ago featuring whiskey. So uh, this is our whiskey basket. It uh, includes a really cool bartender set. So it's got the shaker and uh, the, the glass pitcher and all those things. Uh, you get a bottle of Eagle Rare single barrel select bourbon, a couple of glasses, and then the coveted Whiskey Baron cocktail recipe. Those of you who know our client, uh, the Beer Baron, um, they make something called the Whiskey Baron. It's like whiskey with just like a little hint of peach liqueur. It's, it's incredible. So uh, this prize goes to Patrick Crow. Patrick Crow, congratulations. So Patrick Crow, you're going to be walking away with the whiskey basket. So we'll, we'll get that off to you. Okay. And the, uh, the final prize tonight, we've got... Uh, the Romantic Getaway. So uh, this is uh, one of the Fremont Bank uh, homes that we own in Pebble Beach. Um, this one's called the Los Altos House because it's on Los Altos Avenue and in Pebble Beach. It's behind the gates. Um, it's a cute little uh, bungalow uh, with kind of a Japanese theme design to it. Uh, great, great place for, um, you know, for a getaway. It's two nights, and um, uh, this will go to the winner and, the, and a guest. And this is going to Suresh Mahawar. Suresh Mahawar, congratulations. Uh, uh, Suresh Mahawar, I think we've actually done some SBA loans for you. So um, great, great to have you on board here, and um, congratulations on the prize. Okay, um, Tanya. Um, uh, Michelle, any last last minute things that I forgot to do before we wrap up here? I love that you ask us. Someone just asked if this recording will be available. So we, we could follow up with that after um, tonight and let them know via email for those that signed up. Yeah, that's great. I think there, there probably is some good information um, that people want to come back to. And again, um, who, 
who should we have uh, somebody email if they've got additional questions? Do we have email addresses for everybody available? For all the speakers or for whom? Yeah. And maybe um, if there's specific questions. Probably we could just send everybody everybody's contact and then, you know, who it came tonight, send them one yeah. sheet with all the contacts. If everybody's good with that, we could do that. Hello, um, can I, you hear me? This is Suresh Mahawar. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome, Suresh. Thanks for joining Appreciate us tonight. It. Wonderful event. We learned a lot of good things today. Excellent. Yeah, okay. thank you. Well, right. um, thanks, everybody. I, uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead. If the panelists are okay with uh, sharing email addresses, we'll get those out. And, um, yeah, we're going to be doing more uh, series like these. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like we've got a lot to share, you know, Fremont Bank, we see a lot of uh, financing, a lot of purchases, a lot of investment. And so we want to share as much of, of, of our expertise with you as possible. And, and it's great, again, to have such fantastic partners like, uh, like Simon, Tim, Kurt, and, uh, and Michael. So uh, again, thank you all for a great night. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Good luck with your CRE purchase. <laughs>